So this is where chronology can get really confusing. In this lecture, I'll ling linger in the early 20th century, but shift focus to artists who pursued political agendas or visions of utopia. So this photo comes from an exhibit of Italian futurist art at the, at the Guggenheim Museum in New York. For much of this course, Italy has been an epicenter of art, but in the early 20th century, many young Italians felt that Italy was a political, economic, and artistic backwater. Far from reveling in Italy's past greatness, these self-described futurists deplored what they described as Italy's museum mentality. That was not a compliment. Their god was motion and even more speed. As founder Filippo Marinetti put it, quote, a speeding automobile is, is more beautiful than the Nike of Samothrace. Hmm. More disturbingly, futurist artists glorified war. There was actually a lot of this in the intellectual era of pre-World War I Europe. Social Darwinists believed that nations like species obeyed the law of the survival of the fittest, and many held that the white race was demonstrably fitter than everyone else. Nietzsche's emphasis on passion, overcoming, and the will to power translated for many into a kind of worship of violence and conquest. Some historians believe that these attitudes contributed to Europeans' willingness to be swept into what turned out to be a really stupid war, and indeed helped spark the initial enthusiasm that greeted that war. Even in the years after World War I, some leaders in Europe would extol the virtues of wartime unity and courage, a theme that would attract many World War I veterans to fascism. Now, I'm not going to read this manifesto out loud, but you might want to check out this overheated, violent, and provocative prose because it gives a real insight into the worldview that helped produce the two world wars. Note that women are identified as an enemy. That's actually a common and disturbing theme in modernist art, influenced in large part by the writings of Sigmund Freud. You might enjoy Sister Wendy's take on Picasso's women. This is one of Futurism's most famous images, although frankly, I think it's rather silly. Remember that Futurism was all about motion and speed. And here's a slide from an earlier unit. You remember the galloping horses? Futurists, and indeed many modernist artists, were heavily influenced by Mybridge's photographs capturing motion. Here's another set on the same theme. Now, I do not find this cast bronze sculpture silly, and in fact, even though it's dropped off the list, it's on our list, it was one of the most influential sculptures of the 20th century. You can see the futurist worship of the machine, but you can also see the influence of cubist art, its exploration of multiple surface planes and volumetric shapes. So we included this work in the McConnell Jacobs list, but alas, I don't think we had time for a student presentation. Many of the futurists volunteered to fight in World War I, and Baccioni was killed in battle. After the war, many futurists would join Mussolini's fascist movement. So Severini was one of the founding members of the futurist movement and a signatory to the Futurist Manifesto. I just showed you some of that. I mentioned the futurist glorification of war. This painting produces what your homework reading, I think appropriately, called a sanitized version of an armored train, complete with sleek cannons and highly stylized troops uh, behind bearing rifles. There is not blood and gore in this painting, and the colors are disconcertingly bright and cheerful. Note, by the way, futurism has dropped off the list. I have stuck it back in because I think it's an important link to the art that comes faster, and an example of where art can kind of give you an insight to what's happening in history. But at any rate, the reality of war turned out to be a whole lot grimmer than the futurists thought it would be. Note how this triptych, not a required work, echoes the form of altar paintings, complete with a predella that is a memento mori. That's a term you need to know, a memory of death, a reminder that we all die there at the bottom. So this is a deliberate evocation of Christian art. And as such, I could actually Im imagine an image like this showing up. Okay, we've already seen Kirchner's grim evocation of the cost of war, and now we see a grim evocation of its aftermath in a defeated and desperate Germany. In January 1919, a communist leader, Karl Liebknecht, along with fellow communist Rosa Luxemburg, led an armed revolt against Germany's post-war government. By the way, it was a socialist government. He was assassinated by right-wing paramilitary units. So let's hear from our next student presenter. Woodcuts had almost disappeared with the advent of what seemed like more sophisticated print techniques, especially lithography, which was well-suited to journalism. 
So why did Woodcut get revived by Expressionist artists? Well, note the harsh, thick, angular lines of the work. We've seen this in Kirchner's work as well. Uh, Kolwitz was especially famous for her depictions of mothers and children, often dead children. The tradition of the, holy, of the highly emotional German Pietà lives on in her work. The theme of this work was actually the carnage of the wars of religion, but it proved prophetic. Kolwitz's own son would perish in World War I, which only reinforced her commitment to portraying the suffering of women and children in a world wracked by violence. And while she wasn't a communist, uh, Kathy Kolwitz also was committed to depicting the plight of the working class. In this sense, she fits into the realist tradition. You could really imagine Corbet doing a work like this. And this is a somewhat earlier work, a sandpapered etching, not a woodcut. So now we move east to Russia and the art of the Russian Revolution. Now, many Russian artists embraced avant-garde art for the same reason that Italian painters launched futurism. They despised their country's past, and they wanted to see their society and its art modernized and transformed. Suprematism was a Russian avant-garde movement that celebrated, quote, the supremacy of pure feeling, unquote. That is abstraction. And its most famous proponent was Kasimir Malevich. Suprematism has dropped off the list, but it was highly influential, so I'm dropping it back in. So these two pro-Soviet propaganda posters both show the influence of Malevich and suprematism. But once the Russian Civil War was over, communist leaders called for art that would more clearly serve the revolution and help build a new society. Malevich, by the way, was disgusted by this and went back to pure mathematics. But here is a video clip that describes Soviet artists' response, an artistic movement known as constructivism. We'll get to our constructive work next. So I'm going to talk more about photomontage when we get to Dada art. We learned about constructivism from the video. Now let's hear from our student presenter. Eventually, the communist leadership soured even on constructivist art. Stalin, like Hitler, had no patience for abstraction, and in 1932 he decreed that socialist realism, that is, naturalistic art that celebrated the worker there, strong art deco tones here too, we'll get to that when we see architecture, but this was the only acceptable artwork, and here's a famous example. And note that this work from our Asian art unit uh, fits into the same socialist realist tradition, but we see a more romantic gloss. Mao, I would argue, was much more of a romantic. And we see more references to traditional landscape paintings. Away from the maelstrom of revolutionary Russia and post-war Germany, utopian visions often took on a more abstract utopian cast. Two examples of this are the organic sculpture of Brancusi and the geometric paintings of Mondrian. Both artists sought a more rational, more humane new order. Now, we've already talked a little bit about this sculpture, and of course, our required work is from an earlier period. The video clip puts it into the context of a move toward abstraction, and it offers an excellent introduction to our next required work by Mondrian. The video didn't include this label for the movement that Mondrian led, but you need to know it. I'll talk more about De Stijl's wider impact in a moment, but first let's hear from our next presenter. Okay, this is getting way ahead of our story, and it isn't on the list. But Calder's moving sculptures, or mobiles, were heavily influenced both by Mondrian's paintings and by early 20th century preoccupation with depicting movement and the relationship between time and space. And since they don't show up in our global contemporary unit, I'm sticking them in now. De Stijl's greatest impact came in the field of architecture. Now, I'll have a later lecture on architecture, but this work has now dropped off the list, so I'm going to address it now and only briefly. This is a De Stijl house constructed in the Netherlands. Note the assemblage of geometric shapes. This used to be a college board favorite. It really, I think, looks like a Mondrian built by construction workers. The same architect, Rietveld, also designed furniture for his open plan houses. Looks a bit like a furniture version of a Mondrian painting, doesn't it? In my next lecture, I'm going to leave this logical utopian world and take us to the wild worlds of Dada and surrealism.